It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the films of May 6, 2005. we got four movies to look at. It is, of course, the start of the summer movie season, but this is still the time when Hollywood studios really aren't using the big blockbusters to promote the first weekend of the year. It's not like Spider-Man every single, you know, every single, it's a Spider-Man caliber blockbuster every, is every May at this point, even though uh, this was actually, I believe, the last time up until this past year with The Fall Guy that Marvel didn't have a movie open up as the first major movie of the month of May. So, we've got four films to look at here. Ridley Scott's newest film, of course, and then we also have, um, um, can't remember what the second film was. Oh, how can I forget this one? Paris Hilton making her long-awaited big-screen debut in the horror film The House of Wax, the remake of The House of Wax. Um, we have the Best Picture winner of the year, Crash, and we also have Jiminy Glick in La La Wood. So we got four films to look at overall, so um, let's just jump on into it. We'll start off with the biggest new release of the weekend, and that is Ridley Scott's film, Kingdom of Heaven. So Kingdom of Heaven is a heavenly fictionalized portrayal of the events leading to the Third Crusade, focusing mainly on Valian of, Ebl of Eblin, who fights to defeat the Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem from the Ayyubid Sultan Saladin. I have no idea if I pronounced any of those that correctly, but I'm assuming I did. Uh, to Orlando Bloom, who's coming off of Pirates of the Caribbean, you also have Ava Green, pre-Casino Royale, and the cast also includes Jeremy Irons, Brendan Gleeson, and Liam Neeson among its cast. And this was back when Ridley Scott was really an ambitious director that everyone could really look in, a guy like me can really look forward to what he does next because this is clearly a movie he was trying to capture the magic of Gladiator again. I mean, it's literally on the marketing from the director of Gladiator. It doesn't say anything about Alien, doesn't say anything about the Warriors or Blade Runner, but, um, not even, why did I say the Warriors? Warriors was Walter Hill, but, um, right? Right. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm getting this wrong here. No, I was right. Uh, no, I was right. The Warriors was Walter Hill. I don't know why I thought that was with the Scott, but nothing about Alien, nothing about Blade Runner, nothing about all the other great movies that he did before this, but no, this is clearly trying to capture the same spirit of, of Gladiator, uh, the same kind of box office success that had, and maybe even a Best Picture win, but none of that really happened. The film, unfortunately, didn't perform well, despite the fact that there was a lot of ambition to it. I mean, it's a very interesting little film. An interesting big film, I should say. Why do I keep? Why am I saying little film? But it's an interesting film overall. It's a really engaging film. You could tell the production value is there. I think this is, but this is one of those movies where it's the perfect definition of a film screwed over by the studio. Because later in the year, when this came out on video, the film actually got a director's cut, which many people consider to be the definitive version of the film. The original theatrical version was about close to two and a half hours long. It's a little bit more than that, actually, close to three hours long, but the director's cut was actually adding, this was actually more, actually brought more to it because now it's a movie that's nearly about four, nearly three, over three hours long, and it's really the better version of this film. I mean, it's a movie that definitely is a much better epic film in general, and it's a film that is just really really a whole lot better than the theatrical cut is. The theatrical cut's biggest problems come into play Mostly because of the fact that you could tell the studio wanted to trim down to a point where it almost became something where it was just so all over the place because you really couldn't tell what was going on in the theatrical version. But if you watch the extended version, you get a grander scheme of what the of what Ridley Scott was trying to accomplish here. And honestly, this might be a little bit of a controversial statement. I actually kind of prefer this over Gladiator. I think this is a much better movie than, than Gladiator is because I'm so invested in what's going on with these characters. The action sequences are top notch. The visual look of the film is incredible. It's a really good movie, man, with, with a good script by William Monaghan, a strong cast overall, just that epic feel to it. But if you're going to watch it, watch the director's cut version. The, the regular theatrical cut version is one that you will definitely feel like is not that great overall. But if you watch the director's cut version, you're getting a much better movie in general. That's one I recommend. Definitely check it out. Kingdom of Heaven, definitely worth a watch. So with that said, let's move on to our next movie, and that is House of Wax. Okay, that's horror and all, but you want to know what true horror involving Paris Hilton is? This. That's true horror right there, listening to Paris Hilton's album, and, uh, confidentially, um, 
I was one of those people that brought this album when it came out. I mean, I I listened to it, and at the time I liked it, but listening to it now, and it's just like, it's pretty bad. Like, it's nowhere near as bad as something like uh, Farrah Abraham or Kim Kardashian, whenever they tried to sing. Uh, but you get the idea here. But um, we're not here to talk about that horror show. We're here to talk about this horror show. Uh, the House of Wax, essentially a remake of the 1953 movie of the same name, it's, which is in itself a remake of the 1933 movie, Mystery of the Wax Museum. And as you can see, a group of friends go out into the forest, uh, the forest because that's the typical horror movie area to go to, and then they find this mysterious town where the main attraction is the House of Wax, except something is not right in this town. The wax figures look so realistic and the whole town is deserted, except for two murderous twin brothers. The Menendez twins, maybe? I don't know. I mean, at the time of recording this, they had the trailer for that new Menendez miniseries on Netflix from Ryan Murphy, and it looks weird. I'll, I'll, it, you can go check it out for yourself, but uh, when I hear to talk about that, I just make it a little joke right there. The six friends must fight to survive and escape from the, being the next exhibits in the House of Wax. And the six people involved here include Alicia Cuthbert, Chad Michael Murray, Brian Van Holt, previously mentioned Paris Hilton, Jared Padalecki, and John Abrams. And, um, yeah, the movie itself... Actually, Robert Richard's also in here, too. Maybe Brian Van Holt is the twin brothers, but you can tell I haven't seen this movie in a while. But what I remember from it, it's not that great. I mean, it's really a bland horror movie. It has some good ideas to it. I mean, the, the idea of the House of Wax literally being made out of wax is a fun little idea, but the film itself is just... It's just me. It's just your typical horror movie setup. It's literally Friday the 13th all over again, because you know these six people are going to die at some point, and there's going to be that one... Except for one person who's going to survive, because, you know, they're going to be the ones that take down the bad guys, but... If they take down the bad, even if they take down the bad guys, the true horror continues on here. And this is directed by Jamie Collette Serra, who's gone on to become a very pro prominent director of his own right. He's got, worked on a lot of movies with The Rock. He directed Orphan, Unknown, uh, Nonstop, Run All Night, The Shallows, Jungle Cruise, Black Adam. So he has gone on to have a legitimate film career after this. So this is actually his first film as a director. But this was a film that was not a bit that was not as well received as I think they wanted to. I mean, this movie did the movie did good business, but then again, it's a horror movie, and kid, and obviously you're, you're going to take the dates out on a Friday night to see this movie, and then never talk about it again. So it made it, it made back its money and all that, so they're good to go on that front, but it's pretty much the same story we've seen done to death over and over again, and um, but yeah, it, like I said, it's been something I haven't seen in a long, long time. I don't even remember if they do, if there is somebody at the end of it. I think this is one of those ones where they didn't make it out alive in it. But again, it's been almost 20 years since I've seen this movie. From what I remember from it, it's not that good. Like, like I said, if you want a good horror show, you want something that's real horror to it, watch the, is listen to the Parasol novel because um, yeah, I uh, I certainly have gone through that, gone deep down that rabbit hole myself, but um. But that's a whole other thing altogether. So let's go ahead and move on to another movie that will have a lot of interesting conversations to it. The Best Picture winner of the year. The controversial Best Picture of the winner of the year, if you, if you would insist. That is, of course, Crash. So yeah, let's get into the controversy about this movie. It's not even with the movie itself. It's the fact that it was the Oscar winner for Best Picture. If you don't remember, Crash won the Best Picture Oscar in 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 uh, 2006, the 78th Annual Oscars, triumphing triumphing over the triumphing. I will get it right. Toy boat, toy boat, triumphing over the heavily favored Brokeback Mountain in what is considered to be one of the most notable Oscar upsets. Which even to Best Picture presenter Jack Nicholson himself, like if you watch that piece at the Academy Awards, which I can't show you because the Academy Awards is one of those co companies that will always get on me for copyright claims, and because the, and for some reason the video will get blocked because that's what happened with the pianist. But watch the Best Picture reveal for the, for this year, and watch Jack Nicholson literally looking at the envelope, going, "Wow!" Like you can hear him mouthing the words "Wow," and obviously the movie. Uh, Brokeback Mountain was seen as the heavy favorite, but then Crash won, and the film's use of moral quandary as a storytelling medium was widely reported as ironic, since many saw it as the safe alternative to Brokeback Mountain, which is about a gay relationship. The other nominees, Good Night and Good Luck, Capote and Munich tackle heavy subjects of McCarthyism, homosexuality, and terrorism, 
And one of the, and some critics have said that the film suggested that Crush, benef Crash benefited from homophobia against Academy members, some of whom have openly vocal voiced their discomfort with Brokeback Mountain due to its subject matter. And even Roger Ebert insisted that his column that the better film won the award, even though Bro Roger Ebert himself liked Brokeback Mountain. And obviously, have t obviously in the 20 years, times have definitely changed on the idea of homo of homophobia in the Oscar in the Academy Awards. We've had movies with a, with a gay center gay centerpiece plot win best picture overall and yeah i was one yeah you know one of those things this was one of those weird times in history when i was doing my show because later on down the road i had to talk about broke back mountain because it was a movie that came out and everyone was wanting to hear what i had to say about it and i didn't really know how to say anything about it and it's just like it was it's hard to talk about a movie that uh, like broke back mountain while you're talk while you're in high school and you have to be make sure that you don't go you don't say any bad words you don't say anything that may go against anything against the film is against you know just what you tr is against what the school criteria is for what you can get away with on television but yeah that was not is we'll delve more to that a little bit later on when we get to Brokeback Mountain but this is but many people have said that Crash was the worst best picture winner of all time which I'm sorry movies like the last movies like the King's Speech I mean, think about it. The King's Speech, Green Book, uh, Coda. Uh, I'm trying to think of some other ones here because there's some other ones too. But The King's Speech won Best Picture. Green Book won Best Picture. Those movies are much worse than this movie. Crash is overall a really good film. Is it Best Picture worthy? I don't think so. Like, if you saw that list again... I would probably say Brokeback Mountain probably should win. And even then, I would rather take something like Good Night and Good Luck or even Capote or even Munich. Like any movie, Crash probably would have been my fifth pick out of all these pick, out of all those to win Best Picture. But I haven't even told you what the story is about. This is written and directed by Paul Haggis, who the year before had done Million Dollar Baby. And the film fe features racial and social tensions in Los Angeles and was inspired by a real-life incident in which Haggis' Porsche was carjacked in 1991 outside a video store at Wilshire Boulevard. You see the ensemble cast in there, including Sandra Bullock, Don Cheadle, Matt Dillon, Jennifer Esposito, William Fichtner, Brendan Fraser, Terrence Howard, Chris Ludacris Bridges, Tandy Newton, Michael Pena, and Lawrence Tate, and Ryan Phillippe. And the film was a hit in general. It was a hit at the box office. It made over... It made close to $100 million worldwide, and it was praised by critics overall, but yeah, everyone could kind of agree with the same thing. It shouldn't have won Best Picture. Do I think it should have won Best Picture? No. Does it take away from the greatness of the film overall? No. I think it's a very good film. I think it's a film that works because of the performances, and because they were trying to say something here. I mean, this movie didn't go completely against what a good Best Picture nominee should be like. This is what, like, these. this should be a movie that should expand on these, should talk about social issues like this. Maybe it doesn't do it as well as much better movies that probably should have gotten Best Picture nominations, like Do the Right Thing, or many of, let's be honest, most of Spike Lee's movies in general, but this, this is a really good movie. A cast that works so well off each other, seeing people that you've seen in other movies doing roles that are completely different in general than what we're used to seeing them in. Like, it's, we just saw Sandra Bullock a couple weeks ago in Miss Congeniality 2, and she goes from that to this. I mean, that's a huge step in the right direction for her. Brendan Fraser had a couple of years where he was doing nothing but big budget fan action adventure comedies, and Jet seemed to go back to doing something that, you know, that got him Oscar nominations for the Side of House Rules. I mean, the cast overall is great. The ideas are definitely there. There's a lot of things you can take from this movie that are really entertaining. It's a really good movie, and I can see why it would be is it would later spawn a television series that was actually. Really, really good. It was on Stars and it only lasted one season, but I, I thought that show was pretty good too. The movie is really good. Like I said, it's a good movie, but it definitely shouldn't have been the best picture winner. I think that just because around that time, you know, people were still so hesitant to even nominate a best picture, nominate a movie like Brokeback Mountain with two center gay characters for best picture, and the fact that it really had a chance to win, and then they basically. It's, it probably is like a Hoop Dream situation in general because, like, remember with Hoop Dreams, you know, everyone thought that that movie was going to be nominated for the best documentary, but the documentary film board purposefully gave it the lowest ratings possible so that they wouldn't have to give it an award, and it basically meant, meant radical changes for the do documentary film board. I feel like something like that was happening here with Brokeback Mountain. That's why it didn't get the nominated. 
the win that it probably deserved and should have deserved, but it's a really good movie. I really like it a lot. I really like Crash a lot, but like I said, it shouldn't have been the best picture one. I think the other five films, the other four films that were in here were much better movies in general. Even something like Capote, which is pretty much your typical biopic, benefited from a strong performance by Phyllis Seymour Hoffman, which won him a best, pick, best actor in an Oscar um, in that year in particular. But we'll get to that film. We'll get to those other films later on down the road. But for Crash, I think it's a good movie. It shouldn't have won best picture, but I don't think it's as bad as people make it out to be. And like I said, it's not the worst best picture winner of all time. I mean, this is... King's Speech, Green Book, Coda. I just think three movies that shouldn't have won Best Picture because there were so many better movies that nominated in those years that should have won. This is by far not the worst Best Picture winner at all, by any means necessary. So, so yeah, that's my long uh, thoughts on Crash. Let's go ahead and move on to the last movie we have here, and that is Martin Short bringing his character from primetime Glick to the big screen in Jiminy Glick in Lala Wood. So this is uh, Jiminy Glick and Lala Wood taking Martin Short's character from the Comedy Central series Primetime Glick and bringing him into the big to the big screen. And um, let's just say that this is no Saturday Night Live movie that's done well. This isn't Wayne's World. This isn't the Blues Brothers. This is more like It's Pat the movie, except not as offensive and not nearly as horrendous as that movie is. In this movie, uh, Jiminy Glick is a morbidly obese movie critic who's involved in a murder case at the Toronto International Film Festival. Got a group a big cast including Jan Hooks playing his wife, uh, Linda Cardellini, Mo Collins, Ari Spears, and, a ca and numerous cameos by different celebrities, Willem Dafoe, Willie Goldberg, Jake Gyllenhaal, Kurt Russell, Kevin Kline, Rob Lowe, Steve Martin, Susan Sarandon, Chloe Sevigny, Sharon Stone, Kiefer Sutherland, Forrest Whitaker. I mean, a good cast overall in this movie, and a good idea, but some characters just don't deserve to be on the big screen, and definitely... Jiminy Glick is one of those characters that got old pretty quickly, and, you know, this is one of those movies that probably should have just stayed as a television series because, man, this really wasn't all that funny. And I like Martin Short a lot. I think Martin Short is a lot funnier than people give him credit for, but, man, this movie just, it just wouldn't shut up. I mean, this movie got boring really fast. I mean, this is not... This isn't Sasha Baron Cohen, who was able to take some of his most popular characters from the Ali G show and actually make... Some pretty good movies out of them in general, but even that shtick got old pretty quickly. This, this got old within ten minutes, and not even not we're not even at the length of the of an episode of the show yet. And this thing got old really fast. Like this is just dry, dull humor, with a character that has proven to be funny in smaller increments. This this literally does feel like a bad SNL sketch, blown up for the big screen. Because even in a bad SNL movie. You see what they're trying to accomplish. You see what they're, what they're trying to do in terms of what they're trying to sell you on. But this, this just feels like a movie that's going for the cheap jokes and just nothing, nothing that really is true of what Martin Short can really bring as a comedian. I mean, we've seen, especially now with Only Motors in the Building, what this guy can do with good material. And just, this was just wasn't it, man. This is just a movie that really fell flat pretty quickly, got old really fast, and it's just, you can see why it's largely forgettable. It's a movie that, has some good aspirations to it, but just not enough to carry a film overall. Just not worth it in the end. It's just kind of a wasted opportunity. And I like Martin Short a lot, but he deserves he deserves much better movies than this. Honestly, uh, this is um yeah, this is not a good film. Jiminy Glick and Lala Wood. And so with that said, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies. And the next time we meet, we'll have six movies to look at, including Jane Fonda and Jennifer Lopez in the comedy Mother in Law, Will Ferrell in the criminally underrated soccer comedy Kicking and Screaming, another criminally underrated movie, Jet Li in the movie Unleashed. We also have Catherine Morris and Val Kilmer among the cast in Mindhunters. Um, Daniel Craig, pre-James Bond with Sienna Miller in Layer Cake, and also Mad Hot Ballroom. Six movies we'll take a look at on the next episode, so be on the lookout for that tomorrow. But until then, thank you so much for watching, and if you want to see more videos like this, Please hit the place on the next page, check out the previous episode, and also don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this on this channel. So, with that said, I am off, I will see you guys next time, and until then, as always, take care.